There's a ton of gimmicks in competitive Pokemon. The Pokemon that are created with a gimmick in mind tend to kind of be stinkers, but here and there, Game Freak do manage to push out a gimmick Pokemon so reliable that it succeeds at the highest level of play. Today we'll be discussing the gimmick Pokemon that work in VGC, the official competitive Pokemon format, and see why they function. Hopefully this dive into gimmick bonds will allow us to take a look at what makes them work and how they function differently from the gimmick Pokemon that don't work. If you enjoy, be sure to leave a like and subscribe for more competitive Pokemon content. But let's get into it. I like to go chronologically with these things, so let's begin with the original gimmick Pokemon. Ditto is a Pokemon with some pretty unremarkable stats. As a matter of fact, it's not just unremarkable, it's actually pretty remarkably bad. With 48 in each stat, Ditto has a base stat total of just 288, which is the same as Meowth by the way. It effectively has the stats of an early game Pokemon and relies on its move Transform to get anything done. This move allows for Ditto to copy any Pokemon it targets, getting its stats, moves, and stat changes. The only thing it doesn't gain is its HP stat, meaning that Ditto will almost always be a frailer version of this Pokemon. While Ditto does have access to the ability Imposter, being an immediate transform on the turn it hits the field, this isn't typically ran in VGC. Players opt for Limber because you actually get more value game to game from Ditto by being able to copy your own Pokemon. You don't exactly have any control over what your opponent brings, but you do have full control over what you bring. Typically, we only see Ditto find some niche usage in restricted formats where legendary Pokemon like Zacian and Kyogre are available. This is because it's the only environment where you really get the bang for your buck that you need to justify using this thing. I mean, what could be worse than a Geomancy Xerneas? Oh, I know. Two Geomancy Xerneas. Since you're only allowed to use two restricted Pokemon per team, you can sort of cheat the system by gaining a third if you use Ditto. Typically, players run a very basic EV spread of max speed and max HP with a speed boosting nature and a choice scarf. This allows you to hit a speed stat of 165, which is enough to outspeed speed boosting nature Pokemon up to 97 base speed. My game theory for why Urshifu is 97 base speed is literally just that Game Freak knows that if it made it any faster, Ditto would be completely unviable. So th that's just like my little theory. Basically, Ditto is a gimmick Pokemon that is complete garbage unless it has a bigger fish that it can copy. Literally, like, it need, it has to have bigger fish to fry. Just one generation later, we have one of the most hated Pokemon in competitive for reasons you're about to find out. By the way, let me know if you want a vid on the Pokemon that VGC players generally dislike. This guy would definitely be on the thumbnail. Smeargle is yet another normal type with unimpressive stats that only learns one move naturally. Smeargle can only learn the move Sketch by level up, which allows it to copy any move it wants from Pokemon it encounters in-game. In practice, this means that it can learn literally any move, except for one down the line, but we'll discuss that when we get to it. Spoilers, but Smeargle got tried for his crimes. Smeargle being able to use any move is quite obviously a very valuable tool. It's as close to a Swiss army knife as a Pokemon can get. But rather than learning powerful moves like Hyper Beam or Photon Geyser, most Smeargle focus strictly on support options. And this is sort of what they have to do to get any value at all in VGC. I mean, look at these stats. I don't care how powerful of a move it is, both of its offensive stats are 20. There's no point in having cannonballs if the best you can do is throw them with your little noodle arms, and Smeargle does have little noodle arms. No. Smeargle's standard moveset is nearly always Fake Out, a Sleep Move, a Protect Move, and Follow Me. The Sleep Move is usually Spore, but it has been known to run Lovely Kiss from time to time to Sleep Grass types, and it used to be able to learn Dark Void, which at one point had 80% accuracy and could target both opponents, meaning, yes, Smeargle could instantly just sleep the other side of the field turn 1. Due to its high usage in VGC and its reliance on RNG, Game Freak decided to make it so Smeargle couldn't use Dark Void in Generation 7. They also nerfed Dark Void to 50% accuracy, because Darkrai can kick rocks I guess? I don't know. When you combo this massive support move pool with the ability Moody, you can see why Smeargle is so hated. Moody will randomly cause a stat to get increased by 2 stages while decreasing another by 1. So randomly Smeargle can start landing 100% accurate Lovely Kisses and outspeeding Choice Scarf Pokemon. Despite its meager bulk, after a few turns it may even start living Presbus Blades and Dragon Ascents because of the defense boosts. Smeargle has been viable in just about every VGC format it's allowed in and it remains a staple of competitive Pokemon. Moving on to Generation 3, we have Shedinja. Once again, we have this trend with a gimmick Pokemon having abnormally low stats. Luckily, this one isn't another normal type and actually learns some decent moves. But do you see that? Yeah, that HP stat, it's uh, it's just one HP. Well actually, no, it's not one base HP stat because that would imply that you can train Shedinja to have higher HP. Shedinja's HP stat is literally only one and it can't get any higher. 
This means that the optimal Shedinja set is usually going to be max speed, max attack, because neither of its defenses matter and are really only there in case a Ditto or a Smeargle transform into it. But why is its HP so low? Well, this thing has an exclusive ability in Wonder Guard. This means that it can only be damaged by status moves, weather, hazards, and super effective attacks. Of course, being a bug ghost type, it's not really lacking in weaknesses. It can be hit by fire, rock, dark, flying, and ghost type attacks. You're bound to have one of those in a team, so really, you're not out of luck if you end up facing one. But let's say hypothetically that every three years, the format shifts in such a way that sand isn't viable, and there's a particularly powerful fairy and water type pair that can eliminate nearly all of shit in just checks. Well, that super specific premise is exactly what happens in VGC whenever restricted formats come around. Zern Ogre, or Xerneas and Kyogre teams, will often slot a Shedinja into their team as a support Pokemon, and more importantly, as a win condition. By using Xerneas and Kyogre to eliminate Pokemon like Landorus, Incineroar, or Yveltal that can easily defeat Shedinja, you can create a board state where the opponent is literally incapable of KOing the Shedinja, forcing a win. While Shedinja may seem like dead weight at first, it does have access to the support move Ally Switch, which is a priority move that makes it swap places with a partner Pokemon. Since Shedinja is immune to most moves, it can function as sort of a more annoying follow me. Due to this strategy, Shedinja is actually fairly common in restricted metagames and respected by most players, because in all honesty, it's hard to find a good player that loses to Shedinja and says that it's cheese. It may be a gimmick, but you can see it coming from a mile away. If you lose to it, it's because the opponent really just outplayed you. That being said, people still totally hate Ally Switch, and that's a video for another day. Maybe a YouTube short. There are a fair amount of gimmick Pokemon in Generations 4 and 5, but none of them see competitive success on the regular, so we'll skip ahead to Generation 7. Home of Aegislash Aegislash is such a powerful gimmick Pokemon that you may have not really realized it was a gimmick until now. It's just that good. I had to have a friend remind me that Aegislash plays kinda weird. Anyways, this thing comes in two flavors, defensive and spicy. Being a Ghost Steel type, it's got some pretty solid resistances and immunities in normal rock fighting and ice. It's hard to beat switching into any one of those types, and with bulk like this, after a nerf, you can see why it can sponge up hits so easily. Its gimmick comes in its ability Stance Change, which allows it to swap to an offensive form whenever it's attacking, and back to a defensive form whenever it uses King Shield, a Protect clone that lowers attack on contact. When in its offensive stance, its defense stats swap with its attack stats, meaning it has base 140 special attack and attack, but becomes super frail. However, because it's so slow, Aegislash effectively only takes damage when it's in its defensive form because it'll usually attack second. All the Aegislash player needs to do is alternate attacks with King Shields, but it's super predictable so mind games like double attack should be thrown in once in a while for maximum value. Another benefit of this is that status moves like Swords Dance don't change it into its offensive stance, so Aegislash players can set up while they're in their defensive form and click moves like Shadow Sneak to get a powerful priority attack against weakened targets. In Generation 7, Ghost MC Aegislash was even used as a way to possibly one-shot Cresselias in the National Dex format of VGC 2018. Aegislash was a pretty common sight in Generation 6 and 7 VGC, however, due to Dynamax turning King Shield into Max Guard, in Generation 8 it couldn't maintain its playstyle while Dynamaxed, so it was always a glass cannon. But make no mistake, Aegislash was still a threat in nearly every format it was allowed in because of its incredible burst damage and utility. Moving on to Generation 7, we have just one gimmick Pokemon that truly saw competitive success. Araquanid was a bug water type with pretty great bulk but meager offensive stats. But its ability Water Bubble made up for this, turning Araquanid into one of the most threatening wall breakers in the game. While Araquanid's attack stat was only 70, Water Bubble gave it double power on all water moves along with a fire resist and immunity to burns. For reference as to how strong this was, a choice banded Araquanid's liquidation would do 40-47% to to max HP Tapu Fini. A ridiculous amount when you realize that Tapu Fini was one of the bulkiest Pokemon in the game and resisted water moves. It's even crazier when you realize that if Liquidation gets the defense drop, it's a guaranteed 2 hit KO while even avoiding activating a Citrus or Wiggy Berry. Water EMZ Araquanid on Trick Room teams was also nothing to scoff at, dealing a clean 60-70% to to Kartana and being a roll to KO if helping handed or in rain. Not only did Araquanid have this powerful water stab in its arsenal, but it had great bulk to back it up, with the Assault Vest sets being able to cleanly eat a Tapu Koko Thunderbolt in Electric Terrain. Araquanid even had another thing going for it in its totem form, which allowed it to be heavy enough to avoid getting sky dropped due to Pokemon not being able to lift it since it was over the weight limit. 
A Rakuten remains a solid Pokemon in every format it's available in, despite not being at the top of its game like it was in Generation 7. Colossal in Generation 8 was such a solid gimmick Pokemon that it even has its own video on this channel that you all should check out. But long story short, it was the face of Dynamax in Generation 8. It could use its solid defenses and weakness to water to become even stronger than anyone would have possibly imagined it would be, given its mediocre offensive stats. While on paper, you might look at this thing's low speed and high defenses and think that it was meant to wall things out and be just a really defensive annoying Pokemon, in practice you find out that it's built with the intention of being a weakness policy abuser along with its ability Steam Engine, which quadruples its speed stat when Colossal is hit by either a fire or water move. Players would pair G-Max Colossal with Pokemon like Surf Dragapult or Aqua Jet Urshifu to activate both its ability and weakness policy, then score a huge KO with G-Max Volcalith after outspeeding basically anything in the game. This rock move not only did massive damage on impact, but also laid hot coals in the field that would damage all non-rock type Pokemon for one-sixth of their health over the next four turns. That is two-thirds of the health for free. Like I said, I have a whole video about Colossal that goes in depth as to how its playstyle developed and how it worked, but you can check that out after this video, so we'll keep it brief and move on to Generation 9. Dondozo and Tatsugiri are the first gimmick Pokemon that have an ability which only activates when both Pokemon are on the field. If Tatsugiri has the ability Commander when next to Dondozo, it will hop into its mouth and grant Dondozo plus two in all of its stats. However, Tatsugiri isn't able to select moves or be damaged while in Dondozo's mouth. This effectively turns every Dondozo match into sort of a 2v1 boss fight. Yes, Dondozo is able to snowball its attack stats with the move Order Up, which will give it a boost to a stat depending on what form of Tatsugiri is in its mouth. However, the Dondozo playstyle that has taken off the most since its release is a team consisting of Dondozo and Tatsugiri, alongside a Glamora to lay toxic spikes and some more powerful fast attackers that deal with Pokemon that would otherwise be able to KO a Dondozo. This turns Dondozo teams into sort of pseudo-stall teams, where every turn the opponent isn't able to KO Dondozo, it gains back health from leftovers while the opponent is chipped down by Earthquake spam and poison from the Toxic Debris. Dozo Giri are an iconic duo and example of a gimmick done right in competitive Pokemon. This is because not only do they function as a unit, but they're also phenomenal Pokemon in their own right. With Solo Dondozo using an unaware Yawn set on Pokealix's team to win the North American International Championships, and Tatsugiri just being a solid Dragon type all around with access to Storm Drain to support teammates. But we're about to reach the pinnacle of gimmick performance with our final entry. Palafin takes the gimmick of a strong Pokemon with a major downside and makes it work. Unlike Slacking or Regigigas though, its detriment comes in the form of being a frail, weak Pokemon until it switches out just once. Beyond that point, Palafin gains the stats of a legendary Pokemon with 100 speed, 160 attack, and great bulk all around. Along with that, it effectively has an Aqua Jet with a built-in technician, being the 60 base power priority move Jet Punch. Coming off of a massive attack stat, Palafin hardly really needs to run anything but Jet Punch and Wave Crash, as a Terra Water Boost will allow them to 2 it KO just about anything it would encounter. Its only true Achilles heel is Pokemon like Gothitelle, which will prevent it from switching. But to be honest, having to switch is hardly a downside on its own. I mean, how often do you play a VGC match where you don't switch? Intimidate's the name of the game, so you're going to want to cycle that ability around anyways. And Amoongus regains health by switching via Regenerator. This water, fire, grass trio of Amoongus, Arcanine, and Palafin basically dominated every early Gen 8 VGC tournament and won multiple majors. And while it's currently outclassed by Urshifu Rapid Strike, this won't always be the case, and Palafin is sure to rise again in usage eventually. To close things out, a trend you'll notice with all the gimmicks that actually function well in competitive Pokemon is that the gimmick has to either function to grant the Pokemon a niche that other Pokemon can't fill, like the case with Smeargle or Ditto, or is simply an extra mechanic that allows for mediocre Pokemon to become a very strong one, such as the case with Araquanid or Colossal. There are a ton of gimmicks that I didn't explore in this video simply because they don't work, and I want to check those out in a future video. But I hope you learned something new in this video and enjoyed what you saw. If you want to support this channel, be sure to leave a like and check out the Patreon for bonus content and to see your name at the end of all of my videos. All these wonderful people on screen already have. But with that, thank you for watching and I'll see you all in the next one. Bye!